To save time, let me write a few things so that I can go, go over it quickly. Should I start? John is late, but I hope he doesn't think it's at two o'clock. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll start in. Okay, so let me now recapitulate everything that we did in the last four lectures, three lectures, because I admittedly, I'm sure it's probably went a bit too fast. And it was kind of a telegraphic introduction to some of these important concepts. But I hope I've managed to convey to you at least some important concepts, which you can really sit down and do a calculation. And when somebody says entropy, you should really understand what it means. Or somebody says, uh, you know, ensemble, it should make sense to you. That was the goal, my goal, so to illustrate each of these important concepts by, with an example. So we said that physical systems are usually have some Hilbert space and they are described by some state normalized to one, so that is probabilities are add up to one. And uh, a more general framework is this density matrix, rho, because very often we don't have exact information about the state of the system. So instead of talking about a state, we talk about a density matrix which satisfies these properties. And it is equivalent to a state, when it's a pure state, you can always write rho as a column vector times a rho vector, it's a matrix. So this notation may be unfamiliar to you, but it's kind of a standard in physics notation that it's a, this you should think of as a column vector and this as a row vector. So therefore this product is a matrix. Whereas this is an inner product because this is now a column, row vector times a column vector which is a number. Whereas this is a matrix. Because in general your state could be a sum over such in some diagonal basis with some probabilities, PIs. And so you should think of these PIs, since the trace is equal to 1, sum over PIs is equal to 1. And you can think of PIs probabilities that the system is in the state I. And you don't really know exactly which state the system is in. And one can define a von Neumann entropy in this manner. And the, the point is that when we don't know exactly what is the state of the system, it's natural to talk about an ensemble of state of, some ensemble of states. And by ensemble we simply mean a Hilbert subspace, some collection of states. 
In the microcanonical case, the ensemble we simply mean a Hilbert subspace. But so an ensemble, we really what we want to do is we want to define a density matrix. So ensemble is just a collection of states, and we want to therefore define the probability that the your physical system is in a given state with some probabilities like this pi. So if I specify a density matrix, I specify the ensemble. Right? I specify the probabilities with which the elements of that ensemble occur. Is this clear? So the simplest ensemble is an isolated system of fixed energy. So only thing that we know about the system is that the total energy is fixed. And we don't know anything about that system. So it's like a wine bottle, which is completely hermetically sealed. So it cannot exchange any heat with any external world. So the energy of that wine bottle is fixed. And it can, the molecules of that wine can be in many different configurations. And so there are really, because as you know, the Avogadro number, just to keep in mind, is 10 to the 23. So if you take a bucket of wine, you have so many atoms and molecules in that. And so the number of possible states are humongously large. And so those are the kind of dimensions that we are interested in. So the dimension is that dimension of the Hilbert space. And in that case, the entropy so defined is simply the dimension of that Hilbert subspace. OK? And this is the famous Boltzmann relation which of course would be pointless to call it a famous relation unless you had a well-defined way of discussing what is the left-hand side, because at this point it's just a definition. But the important point is that S has a independent, is an independently defined notion. And for that, you need to go to the canonical ensemble. And by that, what we mean is, it's like a wine bottle at fixed temperature. The system at fixed temperature. Rather than having an isolated system of fixed energy, you have a system which is interacting with some heat bath, like a, it's, it's a wine bottle in a swimming pool. System with fixed temperature. And in that case, rho depends on a parameter beta, which is just e to the minus beta h divided by some z of beta. It's, it's normalized to 1. So z of beta is simply trace e to the minus beta h. So given such an ensemble, so now what we are saying, we are saying that in here, what this is saying is that this, this implies equal a priori probability. So, uh, sorry, we don't we started since. <laughs> but I'm just reviewing. So the, here, we have equal a priori probability, because if the wine bottle is completely sealed, I cannot look inside, then it's a reasonable assumption that, okay, every state that can be there is equally probable. If I took infinite large number of copies of the wine bottle, sometimes the molecules will be going that way, sometimes the molecules will be going that way, but all possible microstates occur with equal probability. It's like a, the same thing that we do for a tossing coin. That we assume that equal a priori probability that it's head or tail. In canonical ensemble, we are assuming that the probability that a state with energy E 
will occur with lower and lower probability as the energy becomes higher and higher. And that scale is determined by temperature. So it's kind of exponentially cut off. Okay. And now, given an ensemble, we can calculate the average energy. It's just the trace of the Hamiltonian with respect to rho. Because rho is, a, rho is giving you some probability. And this is just the average energy. Okay, so very good question. So for infinite number of states, so I'm sort of assuming here everything is finite dimensional. We started with a two state system, maybe n, n state system. There is a whole possibilities when the number of states becomes large, infinite, when you take the large volume limit. There are possibilities of phase transition, which have to do, yeah. So it's a very good question, but something that I cannot answer in five minutes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question and there is a, uh, yeah, so I'm implicitly assuming here that the Hilbert space is finite dimensional and phase transitions don't occur in that case. Okay, but it's easy to see that, see, uh, this is what, what, this is basically typical energy of a state R times the probability to be in that, so I am just summing over all possible states R. Energy of that state is ER. E to the minus beta R is the probability. But I want normalized probabilities, so I am dividing by E to the minus beta R. And what is this? This is nothing but 1 upon Z minus 1 upon Z del log del Z by del beta. So E bar was minus del log Z del beta. And then we, it was natural to define log z beta plus e bar beta is equal to s. Is that beta is equal to del s by del e or ds by de. Norm, sometimes it depends on more variables. Or de is equal to tds beta is equal to 1 upon t, which is the heat. Derivative, I mean the amount of heat that you are adding. Q is the heat. And in fact, from here you can see where that von Neumann's definition came from. Actually, von Neumann entropy is just a generalization of what Gibbs had defined for the canonical ensemble. Because you can see that this definition, so this definition we did as a kind of a way to, it's a Legendre transform. So we think of log z as a function of beta and its derivative gives you E bar. Whereas we think of S as a function of energy. or average energy, and each derivative gives you beta as a function of E bar. So this is the standard thing that one does in Legendre transforms that if you want to invert some implicit relation, implicitly if you want to invert a relation, uh, then this is the way to do it. But it's easy to check now <coughs> because just take this row of beta and log row of beta is just minus beta h minus log z if I just take the logarithm. And if I multiply both sides by row and take a trace, I will get minus s is equal to, I mean, I, okay, let me put a minus sign everywhere. Multiply by rho and take a trace. Then the left hand side is the entropy. 
the right hand side is beta times the average energy because trace of h by definition average energy is trace of h rho and trace of rho since it's normalized to 1 is 1 so plus log z so that's the same relation as here so in fact you can interpret this relation as a definition of the von neumann entropy right that's how you motivate the von neumann entropy But this gives us a very fundamental relation to the first law of thermodynamics. That energy is conserved. If you add heat to this room, its total average energy goes up. And the amount of energy, the change in energy is equal to the amount of heat that you add. Otherwise, energy would be lost. And this, but what Carnot discovered was through his Carnot cycle and so on, how to define various steam engines and so on, he realized that, that heat actually is related to entropy. I mean, he defined the notion of entropy through this relation. And why did he define such a weird thing? Why did he do this? He was trying to understand the most efficient way of designing a steam engine. And he was able to formulate a second law that if you define the entropy in this way, then it is a second law of thermodynamics is that delta S is always greater than or equal to zero. Entropy always increases. Or it can be zero. The increase can be zero if it's really slow, irreversible process. Entropy never decreases. That was his motivation for defining this entropy. And the brilliant insight of Boltzmann was to relate that thermodynamic concept to something having to do with the dimensions of a Hilbert subspace through this somewhat complicated chain of reasoning. And how does this help you? So for example, what is second law of thermodynamics? We know that. You can break an egg easily, but you cannot put back an egg so easily. Whereas the fundamental laws of physics are time irreversible. So why does that happen? Or if I have all the molecules in the half of this room, and I remove the partition, and I wait long enough, you'll find that they're all sp spread over. But you will never see a situation that you start with this and suddenly all the molecules will go to the half of the room. So what is happening is that disorder increases. And a simple way to understand that the entropy here, S initial, S1, is much less than S2y. Because here the Hilbert subspace that is available to you of fixed energy is much bigger. The molecules can be all over the place. And so the dimension of this Hilbert space is much, much bigger, exponentially large, compared to the dimension of this subspace where all the molecules have to be confined. And therefore, since the dimension, in this natural tendency is just a probabilistic, probabilistically, it's like if you have a jigsaw puzzle, then it's, and you just shake it and open it, it's much more likely, just probabilistically, that you will find it broken and not that it is assembled. There is nothing uh, fundamentally uh, it, uh, forbidding that possibility that suddenly the jigsaw puzzle reorganizes itself. But it's highly unlikely if you sh shook uh, millions of boxes, maybe once in a while you'll find that the jigsaw puzzle reassembles itself. But most of the time you'll find that jigsaw puzzle breaks itself. So the, the, using this idea of Boltzmann, you can explain the second law as a consequence of just the fact that in a spontaneous process, generically the dimension increases. The dimension of the Hilbert space available to you is increasing, and so the entropy is increasing. So actually, in this case, in fact, the, we take the energy to be a function of entropy, because I have, there is some Legendre transform involved. So actually, I, I should probably write it. 
E by ds times ds. Yeah, so you should think of just like temperature and volume are some properties of the system, you should think of energy and entropy as properties of the system in a given state. And now we are trying to find relations between the two. So E can be a function of S and V. Okay. Now, if you think about it like that, this is nothing but the temperature times dS and this is nothing but the minus the pressure times dV. So, if you want to make it kind of axiomatic, then you can just define the pressure to be this and define the temperature to be this. But these relations are valid in what is called a reversible process where you are slowly varying things. And the second law of thermodynamics is really telling you when you are far away from equilibrium. So let me actually take an example and then it will become clear. So suppose you want to understand why heat flows from hot to cold and not the other way around, from cold to hot. Well, it follows from the second law of thermodynamics. Because if I have a heat bar here, one at temperature T1 and the other at temperature T2, okay? Then, and suppose it therefore it, this one which is bigger will give out some heat to this bar and heat it up such that eventually they both reach the same temperature. Then what is the change in entropy? The change in entropy for the first one is negative. So as you, you're right, for the first one is negative because it has lost heat divided by T1. But for the second one, the change in entropy is positive. But it is receiving that same amount of heat. So heat is conserved, entropy is con energy is conserved. So whatever amount of heat this bar has given out must be the same as the heat that this bar has uh, absorbed. The energy has to be conserved. So the energy given out by this one bar is the same as the energy absorbed by this bar. So delta Q is the same, but it is absorbing at a lower temperature. So the total change in entropy of the total system is what? It is delta Q, which, which I'm taking delta Q to be a positive quantity. So delta Q times 1 upon T2 minus 1 upon T1. And according to the second law, this has to be positive or equal to zero. This means that T2 has to be less than T1. So is this clear now? So what we have shown is that here is an example where energy is conserved manifestly because the swimming pool is giving heat to the wine bottle and so some energy is being given out so that energy of this bar decreases. So the energy of this bar decreases, the energy of this bar increases, total energy is conserved. But the entropy of this decreases by an amount which is less than this as long as T1 is bigger than T2. And therefore, we can explain all these phenomena like the heat flows from hot to cold or the gas goes from one end to the other by a single law, namely the second law, that the total change in entropy has to be positive. But notice that this is an irreversible process and you know, this is not a reversible process. A reversible process would be if the temperatures are really very, very close to each other and it's, very, the, it's a very slowly happening process, then it's called a reversible process. In that case, you can really think of various thermodynamic quantities as just functions. And these derivatives are simply just ordinary differentials on some space. So you should think of, as far as this law is concerned here, <coughs> think of E as just a function of two variables. And then you are trying to express S as a function of T and V 
or you can express t as a function of e and v, sort of so on. You can play uh, by taking Legendre transforms, you can define various quantities in terms of each other. Okay, sorry. Okay, I better speed up. Okay, so what we want to take away from this is that there is a very fundamental notion called entropy. Okay, there is a notion called temperature. Okay, let, let me say, there is a fundamental notion called entropy. S as a function of E. And dS by dE allows me to define one over the temperature. There is a notion of temperature. And S is equal to just the number of microstates. Log of, sorry. And then the first law follows and the second law follows. Sorry, first law doesn't follow. I mean, first law is, is a statement about the energy conservation. But you can identify the entropy that occurs in the first law with this quantity. Okay, now what does it have to do with black holes? So I was trying to uh, review what we did in the last three lectures very quickly, uh, just the relevant pieces that we needed today. So okay, this part we just did yesterday, but perhaps now you fully understand what is going on. Uh, so admittedly, you know, I have been, it's, it's a bit telegraphic. So for example, if I have not, explain to you how to go from micro-canonical to canonical and so on. So these I will be happy to discuss in a tutorial or privately if there is, in, whoever is interested in. Then we introduce a notion of a quantum field Okay, first we introduce a notion of a classical field. And the simplest example was some map phi of x mu, scalar map from some manifold to real numbers. And you could do a Fourier transform of this. And there was some normalization, so the main point is that I could write it as e dot k dot x a k of t, okay, let me see, minus i omega t this is just a Fourier expansion Using the, and it satisfies some wave equation. More generally, a Laplacian on some manifold mg phi equal to zero, which you can think of as a d star, star d, if you like differential forms more. And explicitly, in, note, in uh, if you're in flat space, it's just a usual wave equation. It's like a generalization of the Laplace equation. It's like del x, uh, I mean, gradient square. And if you, going from classical field to quantum field, simply what it does, Regard the Fourier coefficients as oscillator. As this creation annihilation operator of the oscillator algebra. So basically, 
as oscillators. Operators corresponding to an oscillator. With the commutation relation, a k dagger. So notice that because of this equation, the sum is only over the spatial k because omega is determined in terms of k. This implies if you just omega k square is equal to k square. A k, a k dagger is equal to 1 or we can write it more generally a k, a k dagger prime is equal to Kronecker delta. So, in this way of looking at it, a quantum field is really no more complicated than just a collection of oscillators. And the oscillator frequencies, the oscillators are labeled by the wave vector k. It's a spatial vector. So basically, k is a vector in Rd. Okay, I'm now here I'm doing R1 comma D. But more generally, it can be some general manifold M1 comma D. So K is a special vector in Rd. And omega is determined by this condition. Now, there are various generalizations possible of this. This is what is called a massless vector field massless scalar field. Adding mass simply means you put still a linear equation, but you write this as delta phi is equal to minus m square phi. And in this case, your relation changes omega k square becomes k square minus m square, sorry, k square plus m square. And this tells you that I can identify omega k with the energy because if I square, sorry, omega k, omega k is plus minus this, omega k square is this. If I identify with omega with the energy, it really saying e square minus momentum square is equal to m square. And this is the basically a version of the e equal to mc square relation. See, when k is 0, it says that e is equal to m. We have put the speed of light to be 1. There are factors of c because you are measuring time and this is really the relation e is equal to mc square. But if, if the particle has momentum, then the relation is, this is the relation between the energy, momentum, and mass. So, by quantize, I mean, by looking at a field, we ended up with the notion of a particle. And so that's the only thing I would like you to take away from this. So once again, I will be happy to explain quantum field in more detail. This point of view I can explain in more detail. But I hope you get the general idea. So some of these things I have been I have to say, I have not been able to do it more, yeah, it, but it really requires time, so I cannot do it in 15 minutes. Okay. And one can also consider nonlinear wave equations, so nonlinear field equations.
For example, I could consider so this plus m square phi. And this uh, is a linear equation, but I can also add to it some nonlinear term. And notice that the same equation has kind of, we are interpreting in two different ways. At one level, we are thinking of it just as a classical field equation, where there is no mystery. That classical field equation we completely understand. Phi is just a map, and this is some nonlinear partial differential equation satisfied by that function. There is no mystery about it. But then, by interpreting its Fourier coefficients as oscillators, we are thinking of it as an operator valued function or operator value distribution in, in more general situations. And then defining this equation really becomes very, very tricky. And as we saw, you can run into infinities very quickly because you are dealing with infinite number of oscillators. So collection of infinite number of oscillators. And once again, this I did very telegraphically. But renormalization theory is a way of defining this uh, regularized to consider only finite number of oscillators effectively. with some cutoff epsilon going to, which is going, you're going to take to zero in the end. So as long as epsilon is finite, you're dealing with just a finite number of oscillators, so there is no problem. But you have to take the epsilon going to zero limit in a very particular way. And the particular way has to do, which again I, I have to admit I didn't do, you basically take all these coefficients. So there was a question also, you could have had a, also an overall normalization here, which is z epsilon you can remove and put it here, as long as z epsilon is non-zero. You can have all kinds of infinite number of terms, phi to the five, lambda five, epsilon. Okay? The claim is of the renormalization theory is that by adjusting various coefficients lambda i epsilon, you can take epsilon going to zero limit. At the same time, lambda one epsilon for some finite number of So in principle, you could have had an infinite number of terms here. The f main result of renormalization theory is that, okay, by adjusting these various lambdas for such terms which are local, as you can see, local terms. So I'm not allowing terms like phi x, some green function, x, y, phi, y. Basically, all these divergences can be removed, okay? So this is a statement which requires a two semester course and I'm not going to try to prove it. But I, again, I'll be very happy to discuss this. But there is a, in perturbation theory at least, there is a precise way to state renormalization theory that by adding terms which are local, you can remove most of the, all, all the divergences. And you need to add only a finite number of local terms. See, if you needed to add infinite number of local terms, then you wouldn't be able to do any calculation. But just by adjusting a, Depend on that, there is an algorithm for doing it, which, I, which depends on the what symmetries you have and so on and so on and so on. But that algorithm tells you that this infinite sum of oscillators can be made since. The collection of infinite oscillators can, can be made sensible. And we saw just one simple example of that in this ground state energy calculation, but okay, let me come to that in, later on. Let me just move on. But at the level of classical fields, there are many other things. We could have considered a connection one form. A mu, or it could be even a Lie algebra valued for some group G, A mu dx mu. So this is Lie algebra valued if you're thinking of some principal wonder of group G. And then the 
let's consider g is equal to u1 for simplicity. Then the equation of motion in this case is d d star is the Laplacian on one forms. So it's exact generalization of this. Similarly, you can consider a metric tensor. So it's now a tensor valued map. Instead of considering the scalar valued map, we have a tensor valued map. And that's a metric tensor field. And once again, if you want to think of it, the metric tensor field as some kind of a, in terms of oscillators, it also satisfies a Laplacian equation, which is called the Lichnorowitz, Lichnorowitz Laplacian. The interesting thing is that in this case, it admits a very beautiful and essentially unique to second orders in derivatives, nonlinear completion. And those are the Einstein equations. And you can write them as r mu nu minus half g mu nu r is equal to zero, or if you have some matter present, okay, we can take it to be zero for now. Okay, so I hope the logic is clear so far that we have classical fields which satisfy classical field equations, like a simple Laplace equation. Those are linear equations. Similarly, if you have a one form field, it satisfies another simple one form equation, which is again a generalization of the classical Laplace. But they, such equations admit a nonlinear generalization. So, in general, you should consider nonlinear equations. The transition to go from a classical field to quantum field in the linearized case is very simple. You just do a Fourier expansion. We regard the Fourier coefficients as oscillators, and you know everything about oscillators. You can calculate its partition function, you can calculate Hilbert space, dimensions of Hilbert space, and so on. But the non-trivial thing is the R, the Yes, so for example, for the one form, the equation looks like uh, something like this. It's, again, it's minus del square by del t square plus grad square a mu. Plus there is an additional term, which is del y del x mu of divergence of a is equal to zero. So del lambda a. So if you, okay, another way to say that is, this is the, just the usual Laplacian, but there is an additional term possible now, which was not there for the scalar field. And there is a whole story about gauge fixing and so on, you have to, but okay, but if you choose this gauge, which is called the Lorentz gauge, then it looks very much like ordinary wave equation. So I am now considering a U1 gauge field. So in, in the U1 gauge field, uh, the covariant derivative, because the Lie algebra of U1 is, uh, uh, yeah, in that case, the co covariant derivative acting on A is the same as D. Okay, sorry, have I? Yes. So yeah, let me remind you. So given a metric on the manifold G mu nu, Riemann told you that, okay, there are, you only need to go to second derivatives of metric to figure out the geometry. So the first derivative allows you to define the Christoffel symbols. 
some combination of the first derivatives of the metric. And that allows you to define a Riemannian connection. And the second derivatives, a combination of those second derivatives allows you to define a Riemann tensor. Okay, and all the information about the curvature then can be obtained in terms of the Riemann curvature and various derivatives. I mean, obviously, but you can recast everything in terms of the Riemann tensor. Because everything can be, of course, understood in terms of arbitrary number of derivatives of the metric. But the Riemann's formulation tells you that given a Riemann tensor and its covariant derivatives, you can formulate everything in terms of the Riemann tensor. So you should think of Einstein's equation as simply a generalization of this equation. Okay. So G00 actually is a Newtonian potential which as you know satisfies Laplace equation. If you now add time to it, you will get a wave equation for G mu nu. And if you add non-linear rates to it, then you will get the there are only a unique way to add non-linearities, maintaining diffeomorphism invariance. And that basically is uniquely determines this equation. That's why Einstein was able to guess it. It's kind of a unique way to generalize Laplace equation or Poisson equation, maintaining diffeomorphism invariance if you identify the metric with the okay so this is going to bring us into black hole story now of course now you should also quantize the metric so again metric also has just like light so here what happened was light has also various oscillations it, it, so this is why light is like a wave because this equation tells you that the electromagnetic wave equation, this is the electromagnetic wave equation and the electromag vector potential, electromagnetic vector potential satisfies a wave equation and the light of different frequencies is simply a solution of this equation going in different directions. Similarly, a gravity wave is simply an equation of this Lichnorowitz type of a Laplacian, again a Laplacian equation for small perturbations. But the full nonlinear generalization, unlike here for the scalar field, the nonlinear generalization was kind of a bit arbitrary, could have added 5 to the 4, whatever. Here diffeomorphism invariance more fixes it to second order is in derivatives. So now that brings us to black holes. So should I remind you, I mean, is this all Riemann tensor you remember, right? Or for example, Riemann tensor is a is anti-symmetric in these two indices, symmetric in these two indices. You can think of it as a curvature two form for the spin connection, and so on. There are there are various ways to think about the Riemann tensor. Think of it as a curvature two form, and the Ricci is basically obtained by doing sigma mu. Sigma nu. It's a contraction of the Riemann tensor. So R mu nu here, the Ricci tensor is G sigma lambda R sigma mu lambda nu. And the repeated indices are summed over, so it's like a trace. So the Ricci tensor is a trace of some kind of a trace of the Riemann tensor. And Einstein's equation expresses an of, and the Ricci scalar is a further trace. So R is 
diminuar. If you look at this equation, for g mu nu is equal to Minkowski metric, eta mu nu plus small h mu nu, for small fluctuations, and ignore the nonlinear terms, you will get a wave equation for h. That is the link between what we have been talking about and Einstein's equations. So Einstein's equation is just a nonlinear version of a wave equation. So it's just a second order partial differential equation which in some linearized approximation looks like a wave equation, but it's a nonlinear partial differential equation and whose nonlinearities are fixed by the tensor structure of the Riemann tensor. So that everything is manifestly diffeomorphism invariant. Yes, yes. Yeah, you could you could apply the same story as I mean there are differences, but okay, yeah. In spirit is similar. Yeah, so you have connection you have metric and you have connection one forms in the case of gravity. But the connection one forms are expressed in terms of the metric. Yeah, yeah, it's uniquely determined by the Riemann compatibility condition, and then the differential equation is only in terms of the metric. So, what are black holes? Now, I'm going to speed up a bit. So, uh, it's a manifold M1, comma three. With a metric G mu nu. So the simplest example of the metric you thought was G mu nu was eta mu nu, which is a diagonal analog of a Euclidean metric, Minkowski metric. But there can be more general, this is clearly a solution of Einstein's equation. Because for a eta mu nu, Riemann tensor vanishes. So Ricci tensor vanishes, R vanishes, the equation is trivially satisfied. So Minkowski space, as it should be, is certainly a solution of Einstein's equations. Otherwise, we would be in trouble. Otherwise, we would be living in a space time or approximately a space-time which is not a solution of Einstein's equation. So Einstein's claim is that our space-time manifold admits a metric which must satisfy this equation. So what are the possible solutions? And one of the very simple, very elegant and beautiful solution which was found by Schwarzschild takes this form. Yes. And now black hole is going to be a sub? No, it's a, think of a single black hole existing independent of us. Okay. So it's, it's a manifold by itself. It's a sing, so I'm thinking of an isolated, we have been thinking about isolated systems, right? So uh, an isolated black hole is just a, the entire manifold is this black hole. The way we actually think about black holes is that you have to patch together so if you have, okay, let me first describe a single black hole, right, isolated black hole. So this, we could be living in the presence of a single black hole instead of the, suppose the sun was a black hole, right, then, and all, no other stars are present, then we would be living in the black hole space-time. 
And the remarkable statement is that, which is called the no hair theorem. That if you want a spherically symmetric, so this is spherically symmetric because this is omega 2. Here, this is a spherically symmetric black hole with no spin. Yeah, sorry, R is like a radial coordinate. Omega 2 is the solid angle on S2. The D omega 2 is like the solid angle. I mean, basically this is d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square. G is Newton's constant. And M is the mass of the black hole. Okay, let me come to the no hair theorem a bit later. Ah, sorry. You wrote no hair I will, I will, I will descri describe it later. I'll come to it later. Let me first explain to you what is a black hole and then I will come to the no hair theorem. So, so far this is a metric, okay, this is a solution, solution of Einstein's equation. Notice that as r goes to infinity, it goes to flat space time. Right, it just becomes a Minkowski metric. You see, if you go r goes to infinity, this is just the Minkowski line element. But something terrible seems to be happening when r becomes equal to gm. The metric is, some components of the metric are going to zero. Some components are diverging. So we need to analyze this geometry a little bit carefully near the r equal to 2 gm, which, I will, which is what I will do. And this is just a simple change of coordinate. It will turn out, so incidentally, so this, this singularity led Einstein to declare that this solution doesn't make sense. He actually wrote a wrong paper, a published paper, saying that why such singularity cannot occur in nature, which the, his argument was not correct. And basically he couldn't accept this fact, that there is a singularity. It turns out that singularity is actually completely innocuous. It's a coordinate singularity. It's just a bad choice of coordinates. And, but it, un, it hides an important notion, which is called the event horizon, which is what we will discuss now. So let's just analyze it near near horizon geometry near r near r this is called the horizon but okay is equal to 2gm so this is just a change of coordinates let me call this is equal to psi we can see that ds square is equal to minus psi 2gm dt square plus d psi square divided by 2gm plus this r horizon square times d omega 2 square. So this is just a change of coordinates from here to there. Right, I write r minus 2gm I basically write r is equal to 2gm plus psi. 
And then I want to expand. I can take 2gm out and I want to expand. Imagine that xi divided by 2gm is small. So here I expand and so on. And I keep terms of, so therefore I drop terms of order. Plus terms of order 1 over 2gm. Now, I'm further going to make another coordinate change. Rho square is equal to 8 gm times xi. Sorry. So, what it means is that, yeah, so xi, yeah, it's of order xi over, so plus terms which are order xi over 2 gm. Square. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, sorry. So that's what I wrote here. I write R is equal to 2gm plus xi. I take out 2gm and I regard xi upon 2gm small compared to 1. And I just expand. So if I do this, the metric takes the following form. So this is actually the reason is that rho is like a geodesic coordinate. In that, if I move one unit of rho, for fixed t, if I move one unit of rho, I'm actually just increasing the distance. ds is proportional to d rho square. If I keep all other coordinates constant. Right, so it's like a geodesic distance. And the surprising thing is that I can now ignore this factor. This is some two sphere. So there is a two sphere of some fixed radius. And I'm looking at the, the two dimensional plane, R T plane, near R is equal to 2 gm. I always have to cross it with a two sphere S2 whose radius is 2 gm. So my M13 is a two dimensional plane. M13 near R is equal to 2 gm as R approaches 2 gm is a two dimensional plane times a two sphere. Okay, I, I, I've just done a very simple coordinate change. And surprisingly, this two-dimensional plane, whose metric is this, let me write it as rho square a square t square plus d rho square. So this is m11. So this whole thing I'm calling m11. So the black hole space time is really looks like m11 cross s2 near the horizon. The product manifold. So 
sorry, this one. So d rho square is d rho square. Uh -huh. I just integrated this equation. Sorry, uh, did I this? Ah, I must have missed. You are absolutely right. There is a psi here. I am absolutely right. You are absolutely right. Sorry. Sorry, the other way around. Sorry, I totally, um, thank you for catching that mistake. This was an important mistake. So notice that, therefore, yeah, the, so rho is basically like a square root of psi. Yeah, then it will come out. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm, uh, essentially that is happening because you see here I have 1 minus 2 gm and here I have 1 minus 2 gm inwards. Okay, but now comes a kind of a very, <laughs> a punchline in a way. That M11 is essentially R11. So M11 is actually just flat. It looks weird. So let me prove it to you. I think I have time. Yeah, so sorry, A is equal to, uh, just to simplify notation and also is 4 gm. So rho square A square will be rho square divided by 16 gm whole square. So let's look at R11. R11 is a Minkowski space, right? I can define U and V coordinates. And then it's easy to check ds square is equal to minus du dv. Right, it's the Minkowski version of going to complex. You, you can think of as z and this is z bar. Except that because you have Minkowski, you don't need an i. Right, so you know that Euclidean matrix is dz, dz bar. And now, let me define new coordinates. u is equal to 1 upon a e to the a small u. I hope I didn't make a minus sign mistake here. Which will confuse everybody. Okay. I think it's correct what I've written here. So, and v is equal to minus 1 upon a e to the minus e v. So d s square is equal to minus e to the a u minus v d u d v. Sorry? This is capital U. And this is small u. Huh? No, no. I'm defining a new coordinate u, small u, by this coordinate transformation. Yeah, and I'm defining a, another coordinate small v. Uh -huh, sorry, sorry, v. It is du dv. So basically, I'm going from capital U, capital V to small u, small v coordinates. Okay? So far so good. Now let me write, okay, it might look to you like a long 
Now define small t small x. And then it's easy to check that ds square is equal to therefore e to the 2ax minus dt square plus dx square. And now you define rho is equal to 1 upon a e to the ax such that ds square is equal to minus rho square a square dt square plus d rho square. Actually, this might look to, you be, to be a very trivial change of coordinates, and it, indeed it is. But it really took physicists, I don't know, 40 years to really figure this out. And if Einstein had understood this, he would have not made written a wrong paper, because this is a, if it's a coordinate change, then no geometric quantity is diverging. The Riemann tensor in some orthonormal frame is perfectly finite, and there is nothing, there are no curvature. There's no funny business happening there. But this also leads us to a notion of an event horizon. And the reason is that, <coughs> so let's look at the Minkowski space. See, Minkowski space, normally we draw it as a two plane. So time is going this way x is going that way. So constant u, capital U, that is my capital U, was t plus x. So u increases, u is going this way, and v is going that way. But notice the u coordinates, the small u coordinates, cover only a only a, a quarter of the space, in the only the first quadrant. In other words, as u goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Capital U goes from 0 to infinity. So capital U goes from 0 to infinity. So this is your U is equal to minus infinity. And U is equal to plus infinity somewhere here. Similarly, V is equal to minus infinity is here. And V is equal to plus infinity is here. But that corresponds to only v is equal to infinity and v is equal to 0. So let me check if it is correct. v is equal to minus infinity, capital V is also minus infinity. Sorry, it goes from minus infinity to 0. So you cover only this part of the space time. So that was the weird thing about, so as you can see, I mean, mathematicians like Euc Lorenz, uh, sorry, they like Euclidean space manifolds and so on, because Lorentzian things, it makes hyperbolic, everything is complicated. Wave equation is more complicated than Laplace equation and so on. But in fact, a lot of the interesting physics also depends on that complication. And in particular, this kind of a phenomena of part of the space is missing, okay, it can happen also in Euclidean space, but here it will happen in a more dramatic way. But in this case, so suppose by mistake, you were using U and V coordinates to describe Minkowski space time, and you discovered the Minkowski metric in these coordinates, right? Then you would be missing part of the space time. 
And then suddenly you will find that, you know, if you throw a ball, it's actually, leave, you know, you're not able to describe it. You will exhaust the entire range of your coordinates. Your coordinate patch doesn't cover the whole space. But there is a simple solution to it. You just change coordinates to capital U, capital V, and extend the capital U, capital V coordinates to their full range, and then you recover the entire space time. Right? And what we have discovered is that the black hole looks very similar to this space, but in these funny coordinates. And in these funny coordinates, so constant time slice, capital T slices are going like that. So this is the time of this observer. But small t is actually going from here to there, like that. Small t is going at minus infinity, it's going like that. Small time is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. But it's not able to cover the entire space time. No, no. So here, here, of course, we have in the Minkowski space, we know that t is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Minkowski space time is defined by this range, right? Just like a Euclidean space is defined by, yeah, all of R11. So if I start with all of R11, yeah, no, no. So, no. So if I start with an R11, what I'm trying to show is that, let me start with the entire of R11 in this case. I'm, I'm going to run the argument in, in reverse, okay? Let me start with an entire R11. So there is no argument for you that the whole space time exists. And let me make this funny change of coordinates. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Huh, the thing is that you could take that point of view that, okay, I declare that to be my manifold. But then what will happen is that certain geodesics, I mean, certain geodesics will, uh, you want to make your manifold to be geodesically complete. So certain geodesic will end suddenly, so you throw a ball, and even though you have not really used in, uh, infinite number of, uh, infinite amount of time, uh, your geodesic will seem to end. <laughs> so, so the, uh, so the uh, technical term is, you want a manifold to be geodesically complete. No, so let's look at let's look at Minkowski space, right? You could always take half of Minkowski space, or one quarter. Then what will happen is that some observer who's sitting here at rest, their lifeline will suddenly end, right? So that doesn't seem to be a reasonable uh, physical situation where our life just comes to sh everybody's life here will suddenly come to an end. Okay, you could you may want to live in such a world, but. A more reasonable space-time manifold would be one which, in which the geodesics continue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, but light doesn't stop there. So no, the light continues. So that's what I'm going to tell you. It will not come out, but it will. It, but it's, the geodesic will continue. So, so this surface. That's exactly the point. Now, which we'll come to now. So this suggests that if I want to extend my, so the general principle is the following, that okay, this is also true in Euclidean manifolds, right? If I, if I Euclidean manifold, if you chose, if you got just half of space, then you'll get, your geodesics will end, right? And you want to know how far, how much can I extend the geodesic? Then that will be the completion of that manifold. Then I may choose to chop it up and just decide that, okay, I want to only talk about this part of the manifold, but which is not what one normally does, right? So you, 
the same philosophy you want to apply in the Minkowski signature, that you want to extend your geodesics as, as far as possible, okay, without running into problem. And actually this surface is there, is, but there is nothing wrong with it because no curvature is diverging, nothing is happening. All curvature quantities are finite. So there is no reason to regard this point as any special than here. And why should something just, which falls in, I mean, why should I just declare that the space time ends there? So let me try to continue the space time as much as I can continue. And that is known as the Kruskal extension of the black hole. And it's sort of clear, so it should be heuristically clear to you, but you can actually make it, uh, it's there in my notes, I will, okay, eventually when I write them, uh, I will distribute them actually eventually when they are done completely. But just as here, the idea of the extension is clear, that instead of using small u and small v coordinates, I try to use capital U, capital V coordinates, and extend the range of u and v as far as I can. That's the idea of an extension, right? And then I will get a manifold where the geodesics can continue as far as they can. And essentially, you discover space-time like Minkowski with one problem. Is r equal to zero, you remember, was a real singularity. You remember, the Yes, yes. I, I totally agree, yeah. yeah. No, this I agree. So, this I totally agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this I agree with you. So th okay, so I have been... So, you agree with me that Near here, I can follow the procedure that I have described. And that already tells me that there is life beyond R is equal to 2GM inside. There is some other region which is not accessed by my RT coordinates. Okay? You can actually, there is a, another coordinate which is an R star coordinate which, which is related to the R coordinate by And your small u and v coordinates are really like t minus r star or how was it, t plus r star and v is equal to t minus r star. So now I can do the analysis, I can do the analysis on a complete manifold without doing this near horizon approximation. But the near horizon approximation makes it clear that we are really dealing with a something like very similar to Minkowski space, right? There's nothing very special about this, R is equal to 2GM surface. And then you can extend that analysis more generally at other values of R in terms of these coordinates. These are called tortoise coordinates. And you can write the whole metric Yes, yes. The product structure is valid only near R is equal to 2GM. And the metric therefore takes the form minus 2GM upon R e to the minus R divided by 2GM du dv.
plus r square d omega square, okay? Says so that when r goes to 2gm, is basically du dv, okay? There is some overall scaling, but that's. So the point is that I did that analysis because it's easier to illustrate, but otherwise you can do this. I mean, after all, Kruskal got his name attached to it, so it was, it's a work of several decades, okay, of at least two or three decades for people to discover that the black hole space time had a full extension. This R is a small R. No, so if you just take that uh, solution that I told you, and if you rewrite it, yeah, it's actually the same. Now notice that R equal to zero is a real singularity. Because the Riemann curvature actually diverges there in orthonormal coordinates. But the causal diagram looks very different from what you thought. See, what did you think? If you look at the solution from far away, so let's try to look at the solution from far away. Okay, this actually, this solution in fact describes the gravitational field around the sun very well. Okay, so if you take the sun, this is the sun, and if you are at a distance r from the sun, it looks exactly like this. Now for the sun, for the solar mass, 2 gm is of the order of 3 kilometers. Okay, whereas the sun has a huge radius, you know, million kilometers. So 3 gm is somewhere inside here, okay. So for the sun, you have to change the solution once you go inside. But this solution is valid outside of the sun. But imagine that the sun really collapsed into a black hole. Then what will happen is that sun will get keep shrinking and it will really go into inside this. This is your 2 gm surface. So when you are st standing far away from the sun, constant r is like a time-like direction, right? You are standing at fixed radius and time is flowing upwards. But look what is happening as you come closer. This is r is equal to 2 gm. This is r is equal to infinity. So when r is equal to infinity, the world line of that observer, if, if, I, if there is a person standing here, he just sitting at radius fixed r and the time is flowing up. So this is time coordinate, right? But as you come closer and closer, the time actually flows like that. And r is equal to 2 gm is no longer a surface, uh, is no longer a time-like line, but it becomes like a null, is like a light-like. So that is the main conclusion. And that's called the event horizon. It's, it's, it's really null line cross S2, okay? And that is called an event horizon. Okay? So is this clear? And black hole now, I can now give you a formal definition of a black hole. So you know, of course, know the definition of a black hole from popular thing that the gravitational field of the black hole is just so strong that even light cannot escape it, right? Because if you throw a ball up, 
it falls down. But if you throw it with escape velocity, like a, like a rocket, it can escape the gravitational field of the Earth. But if the Earth becomes more and more dense, then eventually the escape velocity will be the speed of light, and then nothing will be able to escape. That's the heuristic picture of a black hole. But now we can be more specific. A black hole is a space-time with an event horizon. An event horizon is a stationary null surface. Okay? Now I have explained to you what is a null surface. It's clearly a null surface because it's like a speed of, it's going at the speed of light. It's an S2 which is going at the speed of light. Right? So, so that's why it's a black hole. You have an S2 which is like a star. So if you have a star, there is an S2. And it's clearly stationary, right? The sun is there and it's not changing. So the boundary of the sun is a stationary surface for sure. But, but it's stationary and time-like. By null, I also mean the same way as another way to say it is light-like. Right? If I go closer and closer to the sun, my time is still flowing. I'm, I'm just standing away from the sun and the time is flowing. I don't need to go at the speed of light. But if I want to stay at the surface, r is equal to 2gm, I have to go at the speed of light. Otherwise, I cannot stay at r is equal to 2gm. So another way to look on this diagram for Minkowski space, where is everything is clear, right? V is equal to zero. This line is a null line, right? Look on the Minkowski space, right? Minkowski space, this is a time-like line. So with some observer sitting here, he will keep going straight up. Some observer sitting here will keep going straight up. Whereas this is a, this is a trajectory of a light ray. This is a light ray going in this direction. So if I want to stay fixed on this, if I want to fix my coordinate to be v is equal to zero, I will have to move at the speed of light, otherwise I cannot keep v constant. But we discovered by this coordinate change that r is equal to 2gm is exactly like capital V is equal to zero. Therefore, if I want to stay at the black hole horizon stationary, I have to move at the speed of light. That's the meaning of a stationary null surface. Okay, there are a few subtleties, but I think this is pretty, I mean, this is, I think, uh, f uh, an accurate definition of a black hole. A black hole is a space-time with a stationary null surface, which is called the event horizon. And now it's clear to you why you cannot escape. See, in this case, however, see, look at this. Here, this surface is null, but it is not stationary. Because it is changing with time. So light, is, light ray is moving, it's changing with time. So the funny thing about this uh, event horizon is it is both stationary and null at the same time. So it looks like a surface of the star which is out there, which is not moving. But if I want to stay at that point, I have to move at the speed of light. And I cannot just go, I cannot sit at rest there. Yeah, so that's the main difference. You see, at the surface of the star, I can sit at rest. It's a stationary surface. In Minkowski space, here, this is a null surface. But I'm changing with time, right? My, I'm changing with time. The black hole horizon is a funny geometry. It's just a question of how the metric is behaving. The metric is so funny that r is equal to 2gm is both a stationary and a null surface. And such space-time, which admits a stationary null surface, is called a black hole. And now it, you can make it more precise. Now if something crosses r is equal to 2gm, 
right? The geodesic that Don wanted to take, wanted to forbid. That person cannot come out without traveling faster than the speed of light. So it's a, it's a stationary null surface, so once you cross that, you cannot come back. Because you'll have to move at the speed faster. So, look what happens. Basically, r is equal to, at infinity, your r is time-like as before, as you normally think, as we are used to thinking if you're far away from the star. r is a time-like surface. I mean, I'm sitting at r equal to some fixed r, and my time is flowing. So I just plot the time, and that's the trajectory of, of the observer there. As you come close to the horizon, it becomes light-like. So here it is time-like. Here it becomes light-like. And here it becomes space-like. No, no, you can, go, you can go inside. To go inside, you don't need to go faster than the speed of light, right? Even a trajectory which is at rest, it will go inside. But you cannot come out, that's the point. Yeah, not, this is not a geodesic. This is actually not a geodesic at all. Geodesics are just straight lines, let's say, roughly speaking. The geodesics are straight lines, they will keep, so any observer, if you throw a ball, if you throw a ball towards a star, the geodesic will be that it will go on to the star. Similarly, it will go on to the black hole. But it go on to a black hole meaning what? It will cross this surface, r is equal to 2gm. And then it will happily continue. You thought that there was a surface there, there is no surface there. It will happily continue. And then it will meet a singularity in its future because now r is equal to 0 has become a space-like slice. It is a, it's in your future. So this is sometimes stated in popular literature as a, in this paradoxical way that space and time change their role. What it really means is that the coordinates that you thought were describing space and coordinates that you thought were describing time far away from the black hole are actually coordinates of a null surface near the black hole and are reverse their roles inside the black hole. Mass of the black hole is the parameter m, and that actually will. Okay, I have. Okay. No, for a, uh, this black hole, eternal, this black hole, it doesn't change. For a classical black hole, it doesn't change. It's a solution for a fixed m parameter. It's a solution to Einstein's equation, and nothing changes it. It's called an eternal black hole. No, because it's, huh? no, in, in the case of charged black holes, you get ADS, yeah, no, it's not. In, so there are situations, no. Okay, is this clear? Okay, I didn't go, get very far, but okay. I think I was being too ambitious, okay, so I'll, now the final thing I want to explain to you is the entropy of the black hole. And then we are at least done with the title of my lectures. <laughs> so why does such a space time, why do we associate an entropy with such, an ob for such a space time? Okay, so but is this clear that the, the space-time of a black hole looks like this? R is equal to 2 gm. R is equal to 0 is like a, is a space-like surface. It's like in your future. In fact, there is a, two copies of this, it turns out. 
and r is equal to infinity somewhere here. The full Kruskal extension looks like this. And this part is sometimes called a white hole and this is called a black hole. So let, let's not go into that. Uh, the main point is that you have this weird surface which is both stationary and null. And that is responsible for the entropy and temperature of the black hole. You see, suddenly this is a very beautiful connection between geometry, space-time geometry and quantum mechanics and thermodynamics. Somehow, this was why Hawking's discovery was such a shock to many people. And it, it can be motivated in the following in a number of ways. So I told you that entropy never decreases. So Bekenstein said, okay, if I take a hot water of bucket and throw inside of a black hole, I can reduce the entropy because nothing comes out of the black hole. You just told me there is an event horizon. So the entropy that is, I can just get rid of all the entropy in the universe outside of the black hole by just pumping it inside the black hole. And the, therefore the entropy outside of the black hole will decrease. How can that be? So he said, the black hole must have entropy proportional to this area. And he argued, and there are theorems in this classical general relativity that show that area of a black hole is always increases. In any such process, you know, if I throw a truck inside of a, or if I coalesce two black holes, the initial areas A1 plus A2 is always smaller than the area of the final black hole. Yeah, so area, yeah, so you remember that area is just 4 pi times the r is equal to 2 gm, which is 2 gm square. So for example, if you take two black holes and coalesce them, they will form a bigger black hole. Energy is conserved, you can check that so this is actually a non-trivial theorem which was proven by several general relativists over the years. So he said that if I associate entropy with the black hole, then I can save the second law of thermodynamics because then the entropy of the black hole plus the entropy of the hot, hot bucket of water, together they will increase. See, when I say that the entropy always increases, as we saw in the case of these two metal bars, Entropy of this can decrease and entropy of this can increase. There's no, you can decrease the entropy of part of the subsystem. That's not a problem. But what you cannot change is the total entropy. What you cannot decrease is the total entropy. So he said that, okay. But this leads to a second paradox. So first paradox is that second law of thermodynamics is violated. But this leads to a second paradox because <coughs> if it has entropy, then it must have temperature. Because as we saw, del S by del E, energy is equal to M, energy is the same as the mass of the black hole, and del S by del M was 1 upon T as we proved in our thermodynamic course. Therefore, if I change the mass of the black hole slowly, then the entropy given by this formula, this depends on the mass by this relation, I can calculate what it is. And you get that temp it must therefore have temperature which is 8 pi gm. So if you want to avoid paradoxes of the geometry of space time with the laws of thermodynamics, you're forced to associate an entropy with a black hole and a temperature with a black hole. Sorry, uh, there is an h bar. Did I put h bar? I have been putting h bar equal to 1, c equal to 1. h bar will appear here, which is here. Sorry, let me, sorry, maybe I have made a mistake. Let me see.
Yeah, my edge bar is one, so I will just put it one. Now, why do we get this four? I mean, here all that you required is just, it should be proportional to area. That requires a calculation, this eight pi, and that was Hawking's calculation. of a black hole. Okay, but let me recapitulate. So we saw that space-time has to be, is a manifold, Riemannian manifold, pseudo Riemannian manifold with a metric. The metric must satisfy Einstein's equations. One of the solutions of Einstein's equations is the Schwarzschild solution. If you now try to make the Schwarzschild solution as geodesic and complete as possible, you learn that that solution, so in fact this whole space-time is a solution of Einstein's equation. If I choose to work directly in the UV coordinates, they will satisfy Einstein's equations everywhere. And here there is a singularity, so actually here there is a geodesic incompleteness which is really genuine and nobody knows what to do with it. So this is the famous problem of singularities of classical general relativity. But here there is no singularity. Here everything is, I mean, we could be right now on a horizon of a black hole and we wouldn't know. Not a st steady, but we could be just falling through a horizon of a black hole. And we wouldn't know any difference. Because curvature is weak, everything is small. If you had a huge black hole, there would be no difference locally between the horizon of a black hole and flat space time. As we saw, it's almost Minkowski space time with a sphere which is very large. So if you, so that was one point, and now if you have such a surface which is a one-way surface, that things can fall in and they cannot come out, then the second law of thermodynamics would be violated unless you associate entropy with it. And since second law of thermodynamics is some very sacrosanct principle of physics, we let's associate an entropy with it, proportional to the area, which goes very well with the area theorem of black holes. So it, Together everything will increase and it looks all very nice. But then you are forced to conclude that it has temperature. And that co computation was done by Hawking to actually show that the black hole does have a temperature of this kind. And I was hoping that I could do that calculation today, but maybe not. But then, for the purposes of our connection with modular forms, the question becomes, That raises a third paradox, paradox. What are the microstates? Of a black hole. In other words, what Hilbert space are we talking about? whose dimension is exponential of this entropy. B as a function of m, let's say, such that S is equal to log dm. Yeah, what is the, what, how do we associate and this is the problem that string theory has answered partially. I mean, I would not say that it has fully answered this question. But it has, in the partial answer is already quite spectacular. And therefore, actually, first of all, you need a notion of a Hilbert space. Right? In, in not even to ask this question, you need a notion of a Hilbert space. So what you require is a quantum gravity. So you need some definition of Hilbert space of quantum gravity.
and the leading, I mean, the, basically the only candidate really, which is, seems to work is string theory. And in that Hilbert space of quantum gravity, I should be able to identify states which account for this entropy. And this is a completely universal formula. Depends on the area of the black hole. Now, this has been generalized in other dimensions, with charge, with spin, and it's always area upon four. It's a completely universal formula. But that area depends on other parameters, Q and G and so on. But it's always the area of the sphere of the horizon. Sometimes it's, yeah, if it's a spinning black hole, it's more complicated, but. but there's a notion of a horizon defined for charged black holes and spinning black holes, which is very similar to this notion of horizon. So, so reversible is just a process. So, given any system, no, no. So, in order to define entropy, I need to talk about slow mo motions in as a meaning. If I want to I mean, entropy is not tied, or energy is not tied to, uh, let's see. I mean, reversible and irreversible refers to a physical process. Whereas entropy is a property of the system at any given time. So just like at any given time, this room has energy and this room has volume and room has entropy. I mean, any given system, you can associate with it en energy, energy and temperature and volume, thermodynamic quantities. And reversibility, reversibility is the, is, refers to if I change the parameters or if I change the volume of this room abruptly or slowly, that's a different question. So I can always associate an entropy. So the, the, that does not require us to discuss. At a given time, I can associate with an entropy, which is not independent of whether I'm discussing a reversible or irreversible process. So black hole has entropy in a thermal equilibrium, let's say here. So if you're in a thermal equilibrium with some heat bath, the black hole you will discover has an entropy and has a temperature, and it can stay in equilibrium. It's exactly like a hot body, hot coal, which can be in equilibrium if you surround it with a heat bath at the same temperature. And the, I say partially because we don't really know how to associate any microstates in this picture. But if you take Newton's constant to zero, for, for a class of black holes, with charges, let's say charge Q, the single charge Q, such that the mass is basically determinant, is proportional to Q. These are called extremal black holes. And the area depends on the charge Q. And if you look at the same system, as g goes to zero, this is at g much bigger than one, let's say. And if you take g much less than one, the same system is described by some brain system. The same state. So you start with a, so you have a Hilbert space of string theory. Suppose, what do I mean by Hilbert space of string theory? I should be able to associate a state. So suppose I have string theory in M13, cross k, and let's say this k has some winding S1 cross say T5. And I could take a string, 
a brain, one brain wrapping this S1 once, let's say, carrying some momentum along with it. In the remaining four, M13, when G is much less than one, it looks like a point particle. And here there is a one dimensional field theory living on this brain, one plus one dimensional. Right, so you have M13 and cross K, cross S1, let's say here. So at each point there is an S1, but only at this S1 sitting at the origin, there is a string wrapping, a brain localized there, which really means there is a localized field theory or a bundle. It's like a, it's, it would have been a fiber bundle if there was a bundle everywhere, but this is more like a sheaf that you have a field theory living only, it's like a skyscraper only living at that point and not, no, nowhere else. And therefore, I can associate with a state in this Hilbert space of this theory. This is a state that I'm ca calculating. It, it has some charge which depends on the uh, number of windings, let's say n and the momentum. And that shift or whatever that theory is living on that brain, in the simplest example is 24 bosons that we discussed. And now I want to calculate, and the energy okay, and I just have to now calculate the number of states for a given n. Okay, I'm not describing this very well. Okay, let me make one real small comment and then I'll stop because I think the main point is that in string theory, by varying the Newton's constant, because you saw that the metrically depended on this combination, GM. So if I took Newton's constant to zero, this term will drop out and it will look like flat space time. So I can ignore the gravitational effects completely. When G is comparable, when this effect is no noticeable, so there is a way to take the limits in such a way that you can effectively regard that as a state in Minkowski space-time. State meaning a, an object a particle localized here, but it's not really a particle because it has all kinds of excitations inside. It is a particle from the four-dimensional point of view, but it's really a one-dimensional object which has wiggles on it, but in some internal space which I cannot see from the four-dimensional point of view. And those wiggles are described by quantum field theory of 24 bosons. And the number of these wiggles is the number of microstates in which that brain can be. And that I can calculate. And that, in that case, you will find that log dn, this is the famous partition problem of Ramanujan, is 4 pi square root of n. And now you crank up g to be much bigger than 1. And what you will get is that this term that we were ignoring, 1 minus 2 gm upon r. Of course, this is a more complicated black hole. It's not a Schwarzschild black hole, but it's a generalization of Schwarzschild black hole which depends on some charges and so on. Okay? So the factor that appeared there in the metric gets modified by terms like that. Okay? So as g comes up, becomes large, these terms become important. And the same system I can view as a black hole now. And I calculate its entropy by using the area formula. And what I find is that this turns out to be equal to find a black hole solution. Right. Very good. So the particle has some mass, right? Because a pa a particle is also, uh, a particle has this uh, 24 bosons living on it, but because it has uh, tension, this string has some tension, it has some mass. And now the question is, is GM, the combination GM, this all, it has some charge also from the four dimensional point of view because of this winding number. So the question is, if I can ignore the gravitational reaction, back reaction, 
If, if I can treat the metric to be almost flat, then I can do the brain computation. But if I increase G, then I should really look at, regard this as a, a star, you know, because it has mass and the gravitational field around it will not be negligible. In fact, it will sort of start growing, its area will start growing, as we saw, because the horizon area is GM. Yeah, so the real parameter is that the radius of the horizon is roughly like GM, or in this case, it could be GQ. GQ. Question is that you have to compare that with some other parameter, which is the string scale. There is another scale in the problem. And whether this is big or small, you can ignore this or not ignore it. If you can ignore it, then it looks like flat space. You are doing an enumerative geometry calculation. You, know? you are just doing a simple calculation of computing moduli spaces of this or that, or some Fourier coefficient of modular form. Whereas, if this quantity becomes big, then you can no longer treat the metric to be a flat metric. But you have to use the metric corresponding to the black hole metric. And it turns out to be a black hole metric. And the area of that black hole metric you can calculate, and the entropy you can calculate. And remarkably, it agrees precisely with all these coefficients in a rather non-trivial way. Okay, I think I'll stop here. I think I've perhaps lost you, but okay, I could. I did my best. <laughs>